This next session on uh, followership, uh, I'm Gail Hickman from the Jepson School and I have a wonderful panel of friends and colleagues that we've known over the 20 years. Uh, Barbara. Why 30? <laughs> 30, oh no! Uh, Barbara Kellerman and Robert uh, has not been with us for a while, but we're glad to see him back, Robert Kelly and Lynn Hoffman. So we will speak in that order, and I will start us off, and I'm going to be quite brief, actually, so that we can get down to the discussion. One major theme in my own work, uh, and the work of many of my colleagues in, in this session, is the co-creation of leadership by leaders and followers. All of us bring our distinct experiences to leadership studies, and as many of you know, my encounters with leadership began in the civil rights era. I observed people voluntarily bringing their capabilities to the work of change to achieve a compelling common purpose. I've been passionate about this kind of co-creation, partnership, and collective work since then because I've seen firsthand the extraordinary and fruitful outcomes of this approach. 20 years ago, I wondered why this co-creative partnership between leaders and followers was so underrepresented in leadership scholarship and why organizations and other areas of society were so hesitant to embrace this concept. Back then, there was, was almost a denial or disbelief that followers could be co-creative partners in the venture of leadership. The scholarship of members of this panel, including Ed Hollander, who couldn't be with us today, and the advent of technology that spawned the information era and global collaboration have contributed to recognition of followers as equal partners with leaders. One of my passions, like my colleague Robert Kelly, has been infusing the idea of co-creation into organizational leadership. Accordingly, the central framework in my textbooks has focused on shared responsibility between leaders and followers for the whole of organizational leadership. Shared responsibility for leadership has now permeated leadership scholarship and increasingly leadership practice. In fact, an increasing number of companies and nonprofit organizations have adopted one of the strongest forms of shared leadership, that is democratic leadership, as a way of life in their organizations. Now, I'm not saying tons of organizations have become democratic, but this is an increasing, small but increasing trend. Uh, John Gastel, describes democratic leadership as performing three functions in organizations. Distributing responsibility among the membership, empowering group members, and aiding the group's decision-making process. While democratic leadership in organizations seemed, seemed almost inconceivable a decade ago, companies such as the ones listed on World Blue's most democratic workplaces demonstrate that co-creation of leadership is decidedly viable, productive, and profitable in today's environment. In fact, one of the companies on this list is a Fortune 400 company. In our recent book, Georgia Sorensen and I enlisted 21 of these democratic organizations to participate in our research of a concept we called invisible leadership. This concept fully embodies co-creation of leadership by focusing on the power of the common purpose to inspire leaders and followers to engage in leadership. Specifically, invisible leadership embodies situations in which dedication to a compelling and deeply held common purpose is the motivating force for leadership. This common purpose provides inspiration for participants to use their strength willingly in leader or follower roles 
and cultivates a strong shared bond that connects participants to each other in pursuit of their purpose. Participants in invisible leadership are inspired by the charisma of their purpose, not necessarily the charisma of a person, and are willing to engage fully in the leadership process to achieve the common purpose. There's much more I could say about this line of research, but I'm going to stop because Georgia Sorensen's presentation, my co-author and researcher, uh, this afternoon will continue the discussion of our co-created work, and we also co-create on invisible leadership. So I will uh, turn the net rest of the discussion over to our panel, and we'll have more time to discuss these concepts. And so, Barbara? Okay, so I have a question first, and I swear it's a point of information. It's not meant to be. I will be doing some flame throwing, but this is this is this is not this is not it. The question is, um, how many courses at the Jepson School have the word follower in them, and what is the percentage of the total? No, no, there is one course. There is a course. Yes. Zero. Of zero. Okay. No. By the way. No, I, 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 I'm I sorry. Well, well, that's that. You laugh. You laugh, but that's part of my point. But go ahead. By the way, Barbara, I asked my students, "What if we called it the Jefferson School of Followership Studies?" Yeah. And they didn't like that. Yeah. Well, that, that's that's kind of what uh, Terry is saying, and that's a little bit of what I'm talking about. Um, so I, I had a few kind of very informal remarks here, uh, which um, I'm actually going to toss out in favor of something even more informal. Um, but I, I'm increasingly, uh, this is, these are really meta comments. It seems to me to be so obvious that followers have always been part of this exercise of leadership. And that, as some of you may know, uh, my most recent book, I raised this even more, called The End of Leadership, uh, that because of certain changes in culture and technology, they are becoming more important than ever before, so that if we look at what's been happening in Egypt over the last two years, or we look at what's happening in a number of companies, or we look at uh, the Chuck Hagel hearings of last night, uh, uh, of yesterday, uh, we're going, Obviously, the people in charge don't have control even the way they used to. I think they have much less control even than they did when began what I refer to, as some of you may know, as the leadership industry. So to go back to an exchange, Joanne, that you and I just had, your answer was, well, Enron, um, it, it's way before Enron. So we've been interested in leadership since the beginning of time, as we've been semi-interested in followership since the beginning of time. I believe it is also accurate to say that in the last 30 or 40 years, we have had the burgeoning of an interest in leadership, which for many of us has become our livelihoods in effect. I call it the leadership industry, this plethora now of courses, institutes, centers, workshops, executive programs, you name it, which simply didn't exist a half a century ago. So the word, and Terry, to go back to your crack, and uh, Gil, to your response, and to your, accurate, to your telling me the numbers are zero, we can say over and over again, and I'm in a way now piggybacking on uh, Bruce's language when I, I will use the words, I like them, uh, source, you said, and you use the word system as you, Mary, did also. So we've even in the last hour and a half or two hours have heard the word system several times. I, I actually have settled on a triangle in which I talk about leaders, followers, and context. But you can change that the triangle is not embedded in stone. The only point is it is so much larger, <laughs> this subject of how change is created or history is made or whatever, is so much larger than leadership that it is stunning to me that we, and I think I can in this group atypically raise the meta question, 
uh, rather than stick to the script on followers, although they're obviously an implicit part of it, um, that, that something hasn't, isn't working quite the way it should be. It raises an ethical question. Because, sorry Terry, you made the crack, so I'm going to keep coming back to it. And I've, by the way, I teach followership at the Kennedy School, and I can assure you that you're correct. And you're correct when you said did a, a little sort of joke, I assume, survey. If, as soon as the word followership is in there, people don't want it the way they want leadership. So in a way I'm raising an ethical question. If we all have come to believe, or some number of us have come to believe, that certainly the way the world works in the second decade of the 21st century and is likely to continue to work, this by the way is transnational, it's tr cross-cultural, it's transsectoral, you name it. It's, it's the same syndrome over and over again. We're talking about leadership, however we're defining leadership. And I know if we asked everybody in this room, everybody would have a slightly different def definition. But however we define it, by clinging to the word leadership the way we do, because that's what the market demands. The market has demanded of us that we cling to the word leadership because people want to be leaders, they don't want to be followers. And they, they want, leadership is equated with a lot of things that people want to be. But as an ethical question, if we think it's systemic and that leaders are very important, this is not to dismiss the importance of leaders. It is to say that followers matter in a way students and, and leader learners, whether they're traditional students, undergraduates, or uh, adult corporate types who are going for a long weekend, in a way people not only generally don't appreciate intellectually, but aren't willing fully to acknowledge the numbers of times in their own lives that they're followers and not leaders. Most of us are most of the time followers, not leaders. So I guess uh, I'm really raising it, and I, I, in my cl closing comment, I will point to a trajectory that is, I think it's disheartening. It's disheartening for people like me and a handful of others in this room. By the way, where's Tom Wren? He's sick. He's not coming? Yeah, he, I he hopes to be here tomorrow. Oh, okay. Tell him hi. <laughs> uh, Tom Wren was one of the early ones, too. Um, so when we started this study, and again, I don't want to get trapped in the pedagogy of, you know, uh, leadership as an area of intellectual inquiry, or leadership as in how to be a leader. When we started, at least I'll speak for myself, uh, 30 plus years ago, I think the initial Kellogg Grant, Georgia, you can correct me on this, was actually not in the 90s, but in the 80s, I think, you know, further back. Um, and I don't know, we can talk about it. It's been going on for decades. Anyway, in the last several decades, while the leadership industry has burgeoned, and I can assure you it's burgeoned, the trajectory of leadership, and I'll speak about this country in particular, has gone precipitously down. Now these figures, uh, I'm going to cite them because I heard them on TV last night, but I, they're not new. They're figures we're all familiar with. 73% uh, of Americans uh, do not trust the government to do the right. I'm using Pew, this is a Pew Research st uh, study. Uh, a majority, 53% of Americans feel threatened by the political elite, by the government, so forth and so on. Trust in government in the 1960s, and you all know this, was up to 75%, and now it's down to, depending on how you can it, let's say if it's a measure of Congress, we know that it's just absurdly, almost laughably low. So what does it say about us as practitioners of this leadership studies craft, which most of us in this room are, if in the 30 plus years that the industry has burgeoned, taken off, our country, most of us are probably in this room Americans, not all of us I'm sure, but most of us. At the same time, uh, our uh, Americans' feelings about leaders, and, and uh, it's obviously most extreme probably with government leaders, but it's across the board. Le uh, religious leaders are less trusted than they used to be. Military leaders, in the last few months, the milita military leaders have come up for, I would say, even ridicule. And you know, we now know about the sex lives of uh, people, Formerly, the formerly five minutes ago revered General David Petraeus and also John Allen ran into some trouble. 
So I'm saying we live in a time where leadership or leaders are denigrated, where it's very tough, where followers have the, their say in a way they never did before, even if it's only pulling people down, not to speak of building something up. Um, and I'm just raising that as a question, as an ethical, actually an ethical, is there truth in labeling? If we think sources, multiple sources, are important, if we think it's systems that matter, should we be ourselves changing some of the language to accommodate the, ra the reality of how change is created or how things happen in the second decade of the 21st century? Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to take a minute to thank the University of Richmond uh, on, in two regards. One is, uh, it's very personal, which is um, over 80 years ago, uh, my father-in-law was plucked out of uh, the, the Pearl River Delta uh, of China and brought over here by some missionaries uh, to go to school. And it changed the tra trajectory of his life and consequently to the trajectory of my life. Uh, because uh, he stayed here in the United States and uh, raised his family here and I met my wife and uh, it, was, it would have been a very different story. So thank you to the University of Richmond for that. Um, and uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, this group uh, for having me because um, uh, uh, many of you who don't know me uh, know that I'm more on the periphery than I am at the center of this. Uh, although uh, I should say I'm not at the center, of, I'm, it's in, in the center of my thoughts, uh, but I teach at a place where I'm the only person who deals with this topic, unlike the Jepson School where you have lots of colleagues. Uh, and so it's nice to be home, in a sense, to be around uh, colleagues uh, who are thinking the same kinds of thoughts. Uh, and that's what I want to do uh, with my time, is to talk about the thoughts. And by the way, I just wanted to note, did we already kill off one timekeeper? Is, 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 is she the re oh, there she is. There. I, I, I thought she did such a good job, we had to get rid of her the first time. Yeah. Put in somebody who's kinder, perhaps. Uh, but uh, uh, I want to use my time to tell you the thoughts that I have about followership and leadership. And uh, some of them will echo um, uh, Barbara's. Uh, it seems to me pretty clear that, uh, that leadership is in trouble. Uh, across the world. In, in my work, I talk about the difference between uh, big L or capital L leadership and small L leadership. Uh, and I think that the big L leaders uh, are having a really rough time of it now. Uh, it's probably been long overdue, uh, but, uh, but clearly that's the case. And I think Barbara made that case uh, pretty well. And, and I think with the advent of technology, particularly as we see with the Arab Spring, with Facebook and Twitter, uh, and, and technologies like that, it's made it even harder. In fact, what I think about is, you know, because we just, uh, uh, there's a movie out about Abraham Lincoln, and one of the things that we know about him is that, you know, he talked to audiences differently depending on who was in the audience and what his message was. And that would be impossible to do today, right? Uh, as we find, you know, um, uh, Mitt Romney found that, you know, you can't even say things off the cuff among your friends. Uh, without it being transmitted uh, across the world. And so the technology has given people in the follower role uh, a much stronger, if you will, tool with which to monitor their leaders. Um, which leads me to the whole question then that we talk about in the last panel, did talk about the ethics of leadership, but we don't talk much about the ethics of followership. And, uh, and it seems to me that as the power balance or imbalance changes, uh, does, how does that affect either the thoughts we have about ethics and uh, on followers, where before we, the emphasis was on leadership ethics, now do we have to have a corresponding followership ethics, and are they the same, are they different, how do they interact with each other, uh, and once we go down that road, do we just have people ethics, is that what it's about, it makes no difference what your role is in society, so the, it raises those kinds of issues. Uh, and to follow up on the previous discussion, uh, my interest is, uh, when I think about followers, is yes, I want them to have an understanding of ethics, but really what I want them to do is act in ethical ways. And to me, that's a chasm that I still see we haven't crossed, uh, or haven't built a bridge to, is how do we get the outcome of people acting ethically? Um, so that's one thing. Um, I also worry about what, as the rise in power, if you will, of, of followers, uh, what does that mean for leaders? 
Um, and you know, I talk to a lot of people uh, who I think would be really good leaders in various capacities, and the answer I get is, why would I do that? Why would I go down that gauntlet? You know, simply do it. And, and what it's led me to also think about, and we see this, I think, most in the political arena, but I also see it in the corporate arena, is that the, what it takes to become a leader, to get into a leadership position, may be di very different from what it takes to be a leader. So that, you know, there's the whole selling of yourself and branding of yourself to become a leader so that people will buy into you, if you will. Uh, but that once you get there, then it requires a whole different set of skills and capabilities and whether people have that. And I'm reminded, for those of you who uh, saw the movie The Candidate, Robert Redford, a long time ago, and he goes through all these changes to, to get elected, and then he gets elected, and my memory is the last scene is he's sitting in the bathroom saying, you know, now what the hell's happened? You know, now what am I supposed to do? Uh, you know, and, and I think that's happening with more people, which is, you know, we've learned what it takes to get there, and a lot of people don't want to do that. So we X out a whole bunch of people as potential leaders. Uh, but then the ones who do get there may, may not have the skills that we need once they're on the job. Um, I'm also curious about whether followers are training leaders without leaders actually knowing it. And I'm reminded of the, um, the famous um, uh, first grade study where they taught the kids through behavior modification to train the, the teacher to, to stand in one part of the room by nodding. The closer they got to that side, they nodded. And, and that we do the same thing with leaders, right? We do it through polls. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton comes to mind. You know, I'll be whatever the polls want me to be. Um, and that, so that, you know, and then you have to ask, you know, we'll go back to the question, is that leadership? You know, if you're such a chameleon. So that's, that's one thought that I have. Um, uh, I also, Bill, for those of you who are part of the Kellogg, uh, project, uh, I uh, did a paper, uh, kind of a think piece back then, called An Underlying uh, Theory of Leadership. And, and the uh, point of it was to start expanding what, we, what analogies we use. And this morning I've heard us talk about pulling in other fields, other disciplines, the humanities, etc. Uh, but I also think there are some fields we've stayed away from that we might benefit from uh, thinking of it through, the, through, through their lens. Uh, and one of those, uh, which we don't often use, is economics. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think about with leadership and followership is that it is a market, uh, that people are out there trying to sell their brand of leadership, and, uh, and that you know, followers are like customers, and they kick the tires, and they decide, yeah, I like this leader, I don't like that leader, I'm going to buy that leader, I'm not. And likewise, followers try to sell their brand of followership to leaders. And you know, they want to get on somebody's team, Everybody who's tried to get a job and be on somebody's team and you try to impress the leader that you're capable and get that leader to buy you so that there's this marketplace that goes on. Um, and um, and you know, I think we could benefit by thinking of using that analogy. Another analogy is we don't draw on the sciences very much like biology. And I've been doing a lot of thinking about this because I've been doing some work with the Air Force Academy. And they have a problem in the Air Force Academy because they're trying, in fact, they have a whole section on moral character development, okay? Uh, and the problem is, is that when you talk to senior officers, they say the stuff they learn at the academy doesn't really kick in until they're about in their 30s, okay? Well, that's well and good, but we put them in situations where they need to use it when they're 22 <laughs> and 23, and if it doesn't kick in until you're 30, you know, that's a long time to wait. Uh, and it got me thinking about the biology, uh, that maybe what's going on is that, and this is particularly true for males, is we know through biology that the male brain doesn't fully develop till you're about 25. The frontal lobes don't fully come together, and you're not able to have good decision making, good judgment. And yet we put kids who are 22 in situations where they have to exercise a lot of judgment in wartime. Um, and so whether we could think about what are the, if you will, the biological, physiological implications on leadership and, and followership development. Uh, and when are people, quote, ready uh, in a biological or physiological sense to do these tasks that we ask them to do and make the judgments we ask them to do? Um, let's see. <coughs> um, another thing that I've been thinking about, and this is a, kind of a pet peeve of mine, and I know it might uh, uh, touch some nerves, is the whole area of uh, transformational or charismatic leadership, 
Uh, some of you who've read my work know I'm uh, a critic of that, and I'm a critic of it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is, first, I know very few people who have ever come across a transformational leader uh, or a charismatic leader. And when I ask people, have you ever had that experience with someone, they always come up empty. Um, and you know, they might talk about a parent or they might talk about a teacher they had or maybe a, a minister, somebody who is in some kind of developmental role for them. But out on the job, I very seldom hear that. Um, and so, uh, but even if it's true, I then wonder what kind of followership does that elicit when you have a charismatic or transformational leader? What kind of follower wants that? And is that something that's, quote, good for society? Uh, and I think a lot about this leadership, <coughs> followership interaction. Uh, you know, what do different leadership styles, what kind of followership does that elicit? And the reverse, what kind of followership styles elicit certain kinds of leadership? And then the, the, what I'll close with, um, oh, and, and along those lines, let me just say, I think it uh, presents some pretty strong um, uh, leadership and followership issues. I'll just focus on the followership ones, which is how do you stand up to authority? I don't think we still have a good answer to that. How do you stand up to authority uh, and authority figures? How do you stand up to peer pressure? Uh, we don't have good answers for that yet. Uh, and as people have been talking about, how do you assume leadership when you need to? Uh, either because it's thrust upon you or because uh, the situation requires it. Then uh, I'll close with uh, my last point, which is, and again, my work on star performers, I, I've spent a lot of time on that. Um, and one of the things I learned through the star performer work, one is that people talk about leadership and they talk about followership. In fact, I was surprised at how many leader, how many star performers talk about the importance of followership and learning to be a good number two. But what it's also made me think about is that maybe leadership and followership is the wrong concept that we see that as the overarching concept, and everything falls from that. Where in my star performer work, it seems to indicate that these are just two things that you have to be able to do well out of a host of things. And if you do these two things well, but you don't do the other things well, like learning, having good perspective, uh, knowing how to take initiative, that you don't succeed. And so you never get to be a leader or a follower. Um, and so maybe we need to have a different overarching concept and see that this has a smaller place in the world rather than the big place. So, thank you very much. Wow. My goodness. Impressively on the button there. <laughs> I'm at a business school. <laughs> Well, my department is actually interdisciplinary now, so we actually have uh, faculty uh, in the program who are organizational psychologists and uh, business folks and uh, sociologists and economists, so maybe we're starting to address some of these kinds of, uh, kinds of issues as well. Uh, first, thank you to the uh, uh, University of Richmond and Jepson School for pulling this group together. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to share ideas, and it's been quite a while since we've had that opportunity. Uh, my interest in followership really stems from first year of uh, graduate school reading some of Ed Hollander's work where you have your triangle, he had his kind of concentric circles of looking at leader and follower and context and that really the locus of leadership is that little overlapping piece in the middle of that so that it takes in, into account aspects of the leader, aspects of followers and aspects of situations and feeling that very often the leader bubble got too big and that we really have ignored, and I think we started to talk about that this morning, <clears throat> many of the system kinds of aspects as well as many of the follower aspects. Uh, in particular, uh, my own work started with the idea that uh, in terms of both leadership and um, the whole study of leadership, that we were excluding large sets of people who could have potential for leadership but for reasons of discrimination in particular uh, were being excluded. And so my work certainly started looking at issues of gender and leadership, gender and leadership in mixed uh, group contexts, some same uh, sex contexts, some mixed group, uh, started doing work with visibility evaluation of women leaders in those kinds of groups and noting that the same women who seem to uh, be getting very high leadership evaluations in groups of all women, you put them in a mixed sex group, and people are identifying one of the men in the group as the leader and not this person, even though they're doing exactly the same thing. 
So that kind of awareness of uh, discrimination, which certainly years ago was, uh, could sometimes take a very blatant form. I have a sister who's 11 years older than I am, and um, when she started graduate school, one of her professors informed her she shouldn't have been there uh, because she was taking a man's place and she was going to get married and have babies, and so she should get out. And at 10, that made a very strong impression on me of it, that that just didn't seem right, uh, and that we were excluding people who had potential. Uh, and we were making followers out of people who really were in their own right leaders and when we got them in organizations they were the power behind the throne. They were, they were showing leadership behavior, they just didn't have the title and the visibility uh, attached with it and the prestige and the money. So that just seemed uh, rather uh, a big issue and an omission in terms of leadership research. Uh, so one of the first studies I did at GW was looking at women student leaders and looking at what might differentiate them from their other undergraduate kinds of peers. And we used Jean's Achievement Styles Inventory among a number of different kinds of inventories and did find some significant kinds of differences. We had hoped to follow those up and it's hard doing longitudinal work when you're an untenured assistant professor, so that kind of got pushed to the side for a while, a long, long while. Um, and I did have the opportunity then to expand the follower pot beyond just looking at issues with gender and also the leader pot at looking at cultural issues because I've worked for about 10 years doing a lot of consulting with the World Bank and with other internationals in the DC area and realized that they had many of the same kinds of issues of the fact that leaders were seen in a certain kind of stereotype and people who didn't seem to fit that were not getting uh, appropriate kinds of recognition. Uh, in that context, I also had an opportunity to see that leadership is always not face-to-face -face, and the idea that how do we deal with dispersed leadership? How do we deal with situations where the leader and followers are not co-located? And of course, that's a trend that has gone more and more uh, common. Uh, in fact, where we've gone with uh, our research is actually not now talking about virtual teams, but the fact that most of us, as I think Bruce mentioned, most of us work virtually at least some of the time and most of our teams work virtually at least some of the time. So we're actually investigating team virtuality, that is how teams that have an option to make choices about how virtual to be, how often to use those means, what means they choose, uh, and the implications of that in terms of leadership. Uh, what we're starting to find, and actually our first piece, you know, uh, Caitlin Thomas is one of the co-authors on this paper that we'll be giving at SIOP in April, uh, is starting to actually get me a little worried because We've believed in kind of empowerment and shared leadership and co-creation and all these kinds of wonderful things. And what we're finding is, does, is that effective? Well, sometimes it depends on the issues of virtuality. That it, our preliminary data, and we're going to be, we are collecting more, we'll be collecting even more, uh, is suggesting that in situations where a group chooses to operate under high virtuality, uh, and our, our groups had op options to do that or not, that in fact, collective, a collective approach or a shared approach to leadership tended not to work that well. <laughs> that basically, uh, the groups that were highly virtual tended to do better when actually there was someone who was kind of coordinating, someone who was taking this more leader-like role, not that others were sheep, but that somebody was that kind of coordinator. But that groups that opted to function more face-to-face -face did just fine with collective leadership. They did just fine with shared leadership. So again, I think it underscores the, the idea that the context of leadership, the relations, the relationships of leadership are just very, very important as we look at the outcomes for those groups. The other trend is just that that blatant experience that my sister had um, has now gone underground. And so I and many other researchers are looking at much more subtle forms of discrimination. Uh, so it's not people telling you you don't belong, but it's what I sometimes call the slights, the snubs, and the slurs that, uh, that people endure where they're just not made to feel a part of the system. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing recently uh, and through the support of the National Science Foundation has been looking at how we create organizational climates, organizational systems that support a diverse workforce. Uh, and that has implications both for leaders and for followers, but how do we extend that? And part of the thing, and I have to say, because I'm also on an NSF social psych panel, that we're actually looking at many more systemic kinds of things 
and looking at putting much more social, what I would consider social, into social psychology, looking at social network analysis, using other types of analyses and systems to try to uh, understand better what's going on. And what we're finding is even the things that we used to see as kind of individual behaviors, like your food choices, for example, can be very much affected by the collective that you find yourself in. And so if we take that into a leadership and organizational system, how do you help leaders to try to create the kind of climate that allows people who are from very diverse backgrounds to thrive? And so we have been working with that. Uh, we've looked at some issues with microaggressions. We have a couple studies starting to come out on that. And I think there's some good news uh, for leaders in that piece because, let's face it, we all make little slips now and then. And uh, so is that going to kind of do a leader in if they do have one of these slights? Because we're finding that a lot of times these kinds of uh, behaviors that one person might find offensive and others do not, the offender is really not aware of it. They don't kind of see what's going on and they see the other person as being hypersensitive or they, they don't really understand the implications of their own action. Uh, what we're finding is that if, if a leader does have a history with the group, and there again I think it's the importance of those relationships, if they have a history of equity, if they have a history of being fair, uh, and working effectively with diverse people, they tend to get the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> so if, if there is a little slur, uh, what we're just finding, this paper has just been accepted for publication, is that uh, the implications are not that bad. However, if the, that kind of climate has not existed, if the leader doesn't have that kind of relationship, there's some really negative implications from the followers in terms of, of rejection and not wanting to work and to continue with that person. So last kind of uh, wrap up for me in terms of where things have gone. Um, I learned in graduate school about the Zeingarnik effect that you, we all kind of remember and we, we have this uh, desire to complete incomplete actions. And so one of the incomplete actions for me was this study that was published back in Cycle Women Quarterly many years ago. And so Caitlin and I are actually now trying to follow up those women from that original study, those women student leaders, now 20 some odd years later. Uh, the conference that we extracted them from back then is still going strong, actually it's twice as big as it was back then. Uh, they're very excited to actually get a generational example also to see you know, what the women leaders were like at that point, what today's women leaders are. But we also want to look at the relationships. We want to look both quantitatively and qualitatively uh, so both kind of do some kind of survey data so we can get all the nice kind of stats that we need to get this out in the, in the literature, but also do qualitative analysis in terms of looking at uh, the careers of these women. What did they face? Again, try to look for subtle discrimination, look for different kinds of issues, the choices they made as leaders as they move forward. Uh, and so for me that kind of comes kind of full circle and we're actually calling the project now and then in terms of where those kinds of those issues go. Because I think what we're trying to do in leadership research is to create a, a bigger tent, a broader tent, a tent where we can look at leadership not just as white male Americans, but look at uh, a much broader set and what the implications are. Thank you. We now want to open it up for a great